I'll go ahead and get started. Um, welcome everyone to our food films discussion for this evening. My name is uh, Sarah Webb. I am the new community engagement librarian for the Clark County Public Library. So on behalf of the library, I uh, welcome you all this evening. I know we would rather meet in person, but this seems to be uh, working out for the time being. So um, we're just gonna go with it. Um, I want to introduce our um, leaders for this evening. Uh, first is Sherry Chin. She is with Springfield, Ohio Urban Plant Folk, or SOUP. And uh, Lee Teven, who is a school teacher, science teacher at uh, the School of Innovation. So I wanted to go ahead and introduce our hosts for this evening. I want to go ahead and give you a rundown of how things are gonna go. Um, we have some segments of Food Inc. that we're gonna play for you, um, followed by a time of discussion. So um, we've got some questions that you can respond to. And then we also have some polls um, which will pop up on your screen um, following the discussion, and then you'll get to respond to those polls um, as they come up for you. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Sherry and Lee. Thank you all for coming tonight. Um, we look forward to um, having a discussion with you about some of the clips we watch and um, <clears throat> hearing what you have to say. And I'd like to add that um, even though we've chosen specific clips and we do have some, you know, <clears throat> lead questions for this, if you have things that you noticed when you watched Food Inc. that you want to bring up, please feel free to. And one last comment is that this is our first time through. So <laughs> thank you for being part of this and for learning with us. So, yeah. I guess we're ready for first clip. Please note that this program included excerpts from Food Inc, which are excluded from this recording due to copyright issues for posting on YouTube. But you can always check out the video from the Clark County Public Library and review it on the Hoopla Digital with your library card. The times for each segment will be given during this recording to help you if you want to watch the excerpts discussed. Thank you. Um, what are some of the things that cause people to choose fast food over maybe healthier items? Oh, okay, my bad. No, let's yeah. go ahead, lead it. No problem. Price, price has a lot to do with it, the cost. Cost. Yeah. I think convenience is, you know, like they talked about, they leave the house at six in the morning and don't get back till nine at night. That makes it pretty difficult to prepare meals. And if you're already all in the car or driving to soccer practice or whatever, it's pretty easy to swing through the drive through Yeah, I think uh, just being right now where I'm at right now, practice, and, and my daughters play AAU. A lot of times what we do for game stuff or during the week, we got practice twice a week. It's much quicker, cheaper for us to stop by a quick restaurant, you know what I mean? Pick up something real quick here at Taco Bell or Chipotle or whatever. Get something real quick instead of going home and taking time to fix it up for dinner. I'm not really sure it is cheaper to eat that way. You know, when we had small children, we couldn't afford to go to the fast food that much because really the money adds up. When you think is if you're not shopping at the grocery store, you don't have things to eat between meals, and kids are always hungry between meals. But we had time to prepare meals, and that makes a big difference. Yeah, let me check that. Yeah. Right, Steve. It's, it's not as cheap. <laughs> you are right. We used to spend more money when we didn't want to eat, but like you said, convenience. I mean, you know, a lot of times you get out of practice. You know what I mean, I'm, I'm talking about people who got the normal busy day. You get home by seven o'clock. You know, what I mean, you don't want to take an hour to fix up the meal. You know I mean, you just very convenient. So, yeah, you're right, Steve. Yeah, time's a big, big factor, you know. We were fortunate, sort of fortunate, because I worked days and Steve worked evenings. And so he would prepare food a lot of times before he went to work. I don't know. 
but I think also it's a taste. You know, I think people think that fast food is good. And children learn that. You know, I think our children learn that. But in the film, it did it did point out the fact that the, it was more expensive to eat better. You know, he talked about the the broccoli. You know, it was a dollar twenty nine, but it wasn't enough to feed everybody. You know, evidently. So I think that that is very. I think that has a lot to do with what people eat, especially in inner cities and places where there aren't. Um, they can't get fresh food. You know what I mean? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, that's another aspect of convenience. Mm -hmm. You don't have a grocery store in your neighborhood, but you got a yeah. McDonald's and a Burger King, you know, then that kind of settles the issue. Right. I think like people that have more money, that's one of the things they do is they buy, you know, organic, for example, you know. I know both my kids do, you know, but they have really good incomes and they, they go to nice stores and, you know, that's one of their things they're concerned about is making sure they eat the best food for their bodies. But a lot of people don't have the money or the luxury to, to focus on that. You're working minimum wage jobs, you know, and you don't have the time to go find that food. And if you find it, you can't afford it. Right, it's just, it's, it's a money thing all the way around. I, mean, I have a trainer now and he tells me to get as much organic as I possibly can. Now, even my bills at Aldi's have tripled. <laughs> you know, when I used to go there and get a whole bunch of stuff for little amounts, but now that I'm getting organic, it is more expensive. So that's that's a real that's a real problem right there. Yeah. I think a lot of times people don't know, like for example, during the summer, Cheryl and I go over to Grace Luther Church, you know, and they've got a garden over there and it's organic. And they you can get food for donations every Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. But, you know, a lot of people aren't aware of that as a possibility. Mm -hmm. And what we don't buy, they give away, don't they? I mean, they give it away to so, people that uh, you know, can't, can't afford to buy it. So that's a really wonderful resource. Um, I, I'd like to share something that people might want to look up when we're talking about organic food, um, it reminds me that um, there's a website called the Environmental Working Group, and they have two lists. One is the Dirty Dozen, and the other one is called the Clean 15. And the Dirty Dozen are fresh foods. It's produce that's grown with a lot of chemicals put on it. And those are, they, they list those so that people know that if you do look for organic food, that you should probably take a look at those first. And then the clean 15 that they list are um, ones, it's a produce that people can get not organic and be relatively safe because they're not sprayed as heavily. So um, people might wanna um, take a look at that um, it's called Environmental Working Group. You can also just Google Clean 15 and Dirty, Dirty Dutch, Dutch and you'll, you'll get those lists up on several sites. Yeah. I've yeah. done that before on my phone when I was in the store to remind myself. For instance, it doesn't really make that much difference with bananas, does it? I mean, I heard that bananas have such a thick skin that, you yeah, know. Yeah, they're all Clean 15, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We've, we've always used things, you know, like when we've tried to buy stuff, like, you know, organic nuts are like really expensive. Nuts are expensive, period. But to try to get organic nuts is like sky high. And we've just always kind of used that same rule of thumb that you guys just mentioned. If a fruit has a really thick skin, we don't worry as much. And, and with nuts, because they usually come in shells, we haven't We've kind of gone, well, I guess we'll bite, you know, we'll bite the bullet and not go organic on those because they're just too expensive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my kids buy organic too, Nancy. I mean, I really didn't know that much about organic until I went to my daughter Mallory's house and I, everything was organic. I was like, wow, <laughs> why are you guys buying this organic stuff? <laughs> you think it's a lot cheaper if you don't get it organic. And then she broke it down to me. She said, well, you know, this is good stuff here. This is the stuff that we don't have to worry about 
um, you know, our kids getting sick from eating. So, yeah. Yeah, the, um, I'm looking at the dirty dozen, strawberries and apples are at the top. Right. Nectarines, peaches, celery, grape, cherries, spinach, tomatoes, sweet bell peppers, cherry tomatoes, and cucumber. Those are the worst. So I think I think what we're I think what we're all referencing is the second question, which is, you know, do, we're talking about what's in our food. You know, sounds like people are learning what's in their food. And right. don't, don't want that. Yeah. Well, and then of course one thing you talk about fresh fruits and vegetables. When you talk about processed food, it's it's a whole other ball. The Washington Post used to do a feature where they would run the list of ingredients of a food without naming the food. <laughs> and you would try to guess what the food was. Wow. And you, I mean, almost, you know, it's like almost impossible every time. Mm -hmm. And of course, the prevalence of high fructose corn certainly came, if you follow that feature, became pretty obvious. Mm -hmm. Then the other thing is that stuff you're talking about, Steve, that high fructose corn syrup and all that kind of stuff. Isn't that addictive if people eat that? I mean, is that true? Or am I, am I thinking something that's not right? I thought it was kind of addictive to start to eat that stuff, those chemicals and all that stuff. I don't know if that stuff is addictive. I know that people respond to sweetness, saltiness, yes. and fatty. You know, those are three <laughs> big triggers. And of course, fast foods and processed foods tend to hit all those. Yes. Yeah. That's when we when we talk about fast food tasting good, it's that mouth feel mm -hmm. that you get. Yeah, them. I mean, I've heard that before that sugar really throws you off. Like if left to ourselves, we would just eat what our, our bodies are kind of smart and they would eat the food that we really need. But when we start eating sugar, <laughs> Then I think it's, I don't know if it's addictive, but I think it is, you know, you start wanting more and more of that. I would, mm -hmm. I love high fructose corn syrup, <laughs> 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 like caramels or my sea salt caramel ice talenti gelato. I think that's what that is. <laughs> I'm I don't think anybody should feel bad about saying, I like the way these things taste because these companies have chemists that are like in the in the lab making it taste that way so that we will buy more, right. want more. Right. We should probably move on to our poll questions. And yes. Get to yeah. the next yeah. section. Okay, cool. I'm going to stop the share for the moment. Okay. All right. So here's our first poll question. So I'm going to put it up on the screen for everyone. If you can choose your answer. The question is, I eat pre-washed, ready to eat fruits and vegetables. And then the answers are underneath. So go ahead and plug in your answer there. Almost have everyone. Okay. Okay, so let me share the results real quick. So most of you eat twice a week the ready the ready to eat pre-washed vegetables. Okay. I'm going to uh, What did you answer, Nancy? We should have <laughs> had the same answer, you know. <laughs> okay, I'm going to move on to um, poll number two. We'll have two more for this segment. This next one says, I eat meals while watching a screen. Oh, sorry, I need to pop it up there. I eat meals while watching a screen. I have that spinach every day, so I have it. You don't eat my spinach that often. Often. Almost there. Okay. 
Often. Is the highest answer there. All right, so we have one more poll for this segment. I'm gonna put that up there for you. I eat at a table with family and friends. Okay. Seldom was the most chosen answer. So, uh, so that gives you a, a nice little idea there of, of things. So we'll, uh, we'll do a few more polls uh, in the next segment. Yeah, I'll go ahead and run the segment. So these are the questions for this clip. What do you guys think about people's knowing what's healthy, how they define it? I think people pretty much know these days what's healthy and what's not. You know, I. Just the people that I, in my circles, they know what's good for them and what's not good for them. But I also find, I think, I agree. I think most people kind of know, but it doesn't necessarily mean that's what they eat. I mean, I that's find right. a lot of people kind of almost making fun of it, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like at work, if I would bring something healthy to like a potluck, they wouldn't eat it. I don't know, maybe they normally eat healthy food and they just don't want to eat it for the potluck, I don't know. I That's wasn't it. ever sure. That's it. You think Bingo. So? <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I but also it must say something about what they like to eat. Well, yeah. Maybe. So do I you think, think if they're at a party, they don't want to. Oh, Sorry. <laughs> No, once you I'm have just this say, knowledge, okay. this is, oh, go ahead. <laughs> My bad. <laughs> you know, I think people do have a general idea, but sometimes they don't realize just how bad certain things are. You know, the Center for Science and Public Interest used to put out these studies about things. I remember they did one back when I was at the newspaper about theater, popcorn at the movie theater. Mm -hmm. And it was amazing how many calories and how much processed chemicals were in that. Wow. And I think most people had, you know, because you just think of popcorn as being mostly air. It can't be that bad for you, right? But right. it was a lot. And then that Center for Science and, pub and the Public Interest they actually got a lot of pushback for people who just didn't want to know. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like, don't tell us this stuff. We don't want to know. <laughs> we want to enjoy our movie popcorn. Mm -hmm. That's right. A couple, a few weeks ago, I went to a um, noon Zoom meeting that the Community Health Foundation had about heart health, you know, and they had Dr. Naravetla on there and they, they had other dietitians talking about food in your heart. And, you know, they were talking about salt, particularly. Now, my husband, like he will dump salt on everything. So mm. far, his heart seems to be okay, but that's supposed to be really bad for you. Well. You know, there's a lot of research that shows that actually there's people who are sensitive to salt. And for the majority of the population, it's not necessarily as big an issue as it's made out to be. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> <laughs> hey, there you go. There you go. We're experts. A lot of times we say what we want so that we can eat what we want. <laughs> I, I got to show that um, about 15 years ago, I did a, about a, I guess about a five-year stint in some nursing homes as a side job, just, you know, working weekends. And I knew so much of this stuff when I went in there. And so part of my job was before I evaluated a person was to go and, you know, look at their chart and look at their diagnosis list and why they were in there, their history. 
-hmm. I remember just being just knocked over by the fact that hypertension and diabetes mellitus type two was on like every diagnostic, you know, every diagnosis list I looked at. Mm -hmm. And I went, oh my gosh, you know, this is like, it's, it, it really is this bad. And then, and then of course I was working with people who had amputations mm -hmm. because of, um, you know, the diabetes and um, I was working with people who were on dialysis and you know, I was working with people who had directly been impacted by this diagnosis, you know, which had come a lot from their diet. And it was quite a two by four across my forehead and I even knew some of this. Mm. And I went, wow, you know, and I think, I think that we don't get to see the end result enough and it's unfortunate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we need more preventive medicine in our country too. You know, it seems like sometimes our doctors are not into prevention enough. And Joe yeah. is going to be having a, um, a, a teacher from Central State come in and work with our students and talk about food health. So we're looking forward to that. You know, it, it has to start while they're young. Mm -hmm. It's probably true that doctors don't spend a lot of time on prevention, but part of the issue is that they're not reimbursed for that. Mm -hmm. Insurance only reimburses you for certain procedures. Mm -hmm. And there are other, other countries where the insurance payments are based more on outcomes. Wow. And that tends to produce better outcomes. You know. Noreen, you should talk. Well, I never prescribed medication. I always started with the basics, you know, prevention before I started medications. I mean, when I practiced medicine, I never, ever started medications right away. But unfortunately over here, see, when I was trained as a physician, they always said you give steroids to um, a patient who's on deathbed. Mm. And over here, I came 27 years ago and I saw left and right, everybody's been given steroids. Uh, yes, steroids are like a Band-Aid. They fix everything, but they cause everything. Diabetes, high blood pressure, um, low immunity, obesity. Uh, I mean, name it and you get it. So go figure why everybody, you know, around you, I mean, it's sad. It's sad. I mean, the chickens, that's why organic is important because they don't have steroids in them, mm -hmm. you know, um, vegetables and um, vegetables, not so bad, but I think meat, chicken, uh, when they put steroids, that's what we eat. That's what we become. So and that really breaks my heart because I see like today I was at the grocery store at Kroger and I mean, the legs of one person, it just bothered me so much that, you know, instead of trying to figure out what the root cause is, steroids, it's a Band-Aid. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I tell my students all the time, you know, you cannot just take whatever they give you. You have to think why they're giving it and what's the underlying cause. Like Sherry, you mentioned something about um, you know, the amputations. I had a patient who had a teeny little dot on his big toe. So he was diabetic. So I stabilized him and sent him to surgery to be examined. And within six months, his entire leg was amputated. Within six months, it was that fast. People don't realize, you know, it's, it's very unfortunate. There's no prevention. There's no, like, you know, I don't know. It is doable. It is doable. Mm -hmm. A lot of the diseases are preventable, but they start out with medication. I don't agree with that at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, yes, I know sometimes you have to have medicines, but starting out with medicine is not, it's not right. Mm -hmm. But that's how they make money, unfortunately. That's why I'm happy I'm not practicing in this country. Honestly, I have no desire to. Mm. 
Do I miss it? Of course. That's what I was trained to do as a physician and as a surgeon. But I have no desire to practice medicine in this country at all. It's not about yeah. prevention. It's about, you know, how can you make more money? I mean, these are human lives. They're not cats and rats that you can, you know, mm -hmm. experiment on them. I don't know. Yeah. That's me. Mm. That's we how I move to our next poll questions. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Um, see here. Okay. Uh, it says, I buy drinks from cafes, for example, Starbucks. Okay. Seldom. Excellent. All right, let's uh, go on. To, we've got one more poll. I make sure to buy fresh food. Okay. Always. Excellent. Okay. Okay, so we can go on to our next segment. Okay. So as we take a look, creating something different or looking towards something that's different. <clears throat> Does anybody have any thoughts about things that have worked for them with regard to um, buying more local food or buying directly from a producer? Um, anybody have thoughts about that? How hard it is? How easy it is? Your experience? Does anyone have experiences with CSAs? We've used CSAs for a while. We did it for a few years back in the early aughts. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we did it again for a while where the people were coming to the spring. First place we had to go out of town a little bit to pick it up. Yeah. And it was Shoveling Farms, which is right outside of town. And then we had to go to the farmer's market to pick it up, which wasn't as inconvenient but it definitely took more effort than just you know making it part of our weekly trip to Meyer or whatever but it, was kind of, it was kind of fun though I mean you got things you wouldn't normally buy and you had to try them and the one place that we did it they had a system where there was a shelf where if you didn't want something in your box you could put it on this shelf and then if other people wanted more of that they could take it and so, you know, that, that was kind of fun to kind of trade stuff back and forth. That's cool. Yeah, all those uh, CSAs kind of closed down. I don't think there is one in Springfield. I know Yellow Springs has one and they have them over in Dayton. But that's why I've really enjoyed working with McCain Acres. We get some food that way. And then, like I said before, the Oasis Community Project Noreen's involved with that. I, I did it one year and then it was too much. But, but I still benefit from um, Terry who does that, the food over there at Grace Lutheran. It's all organic. But I haven't ever done more of trying to find the meat locally and I know some people do that. I would like to know more about that, how to get more, get better meat locally. In the summer, it's easier to get, um, you know, good stuff because I grow stuff in my garden myself. And then I started going to that um, the church that Nancy mentioned every week and getting things like squash and things that I didn't grow. So in the summer, it's it's, it's pretty easy to get vegetables and fruits that are you know grown you know organically. I guess I don't know if it's all organic, but. Uh, yeah, 
the, the meat is another thing because I really don't eat that much but chicken, but I try to buy the organic and um, in, in Aldi and I, I feel sorry for people that are trying to do that and are on a, a lower income than what I make because I know one chicken costs me $10 and the other chicken that's not grown organic, or not, not grown, grown organically, the, 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 the kind that's, you know, got pumped up with antibiotics and stuff. I mean, you can get one of those for like three or four dollars. So it's, and I could see where that would be difficult. I could see that. I can I can share something from the other side of that. Um, and just this is just a quandary that we are all in. Um, we Ed and I raised organic chicken. Oh, for about four years to sell at the market and um, I, we never kept good records, but we were pretty sure that we probably weren't breaking even, that we're losing money. We were just doing something that we love to do. And we were doing it because we wanted our kids to eat that kind of food. Um, organic food, it, organic animal food is really expensive. It's twice the price of what you would get in, uh, you know, like at TSC and, you know, some of the other feed stores. And it is just a real quandary because you just can't afford to do it. That is really something that we have to visit um, as a culture. And how do we do this? How do we do this so that we can do it in a clean way and do it in a way that people can afford it. And we've just got to do it. We've got to come at it from a whole bunch of different directions because animal products are a whole different ball game from, um, fr from doing vegetables. Not just the raising of the animals, but you have to haul them away and get them processed and pay for that. And, and the, the health departments and the high department of agriculture has their hands in all of this because these are things that can really make people sick because they're, they're meat products, they can spoil. Well, when the farmer in the clip referred to the problem of doing something with all the manure, which mm -hmm. is a huge problem when you have these huge feedlots that produce yeah. tons of manure every day. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a challenge. So, On the machine, or not, Steve, um, when you're talking about the diseases with the manure on their skin and stuff, I was watching that this weekend, and with all the manure everywhere, and just the skins and diseases that would come from it, uh, just really eye-opener about all that. Yeah. Mm. Working in meat packing operations is one of the most dangerous jobs in, in the country. Oh, wow. And that was before the pandemic. And then, and then the pandemic really made that worse. Oh. What about seafood and stuff like that? I mean, do we know anything about the safety of that? You know, shrimp recently has gotten very cheap when, you know, I'm, I'm going to be 58 years old and I remember growing up and shrimp was like a luxury. Oh, mm -hmm. shrimp, shrimp. Mm -hmm. But now it's dirt cheap. And I've read a little bit about it, but um, shrimp are detritivores. They, they eat, they eat anything in the water garbage and mm -hmm. you can raise them in places like where the doesn't matter what they eat. So who knows what all this cheap shrimp is eating? Right. You know, it's, it's, I mean, and there's a reason why they've become so cheap. They used to be, you know, very, very expensive. It was, yeah. um, but now, you know, because they can produce them faster, raise them on things that might not be so good. Yeah. Even my cat has been eating shrimp. <laughs> so, you know, it's cheap. <laughs> You know, I think, you know, Lee, you brought up a really good point because part of what, um, you know, part of what Joel Salatin, that farmer referred to was, you know, they're not eating dead cows and corn. And, and we've seen other instances where um, cows have been fed some pretty disgusting stuff because it's left over from some other industry without yeah. any regard to whether 
their digestive system was designed to digest that and then you get disease, et cetera. And um, I kind of wonder, I don't know anything about shrimp, but I'm wondering now that you brought that up, whether it's like, oh, so what are they feeding the shrimp now? <laughs> right. <laughs> Which is why you want to go small if you can, you know, work within your local, you know, your local uh, oh. and develop systems, you know, develop hope, you know, that's, this, that's a big order, but develop systems where people are raising them in small scale locally. Okay. Yeah, the first I thought you meant little shrimp. Seafood is the warming <laughs> of the oceans. Um, lobster, or lobstermen are having a lot of problems because they're the places that the lobster live. They're migrating because the water is getting too warm for them to live. Mm -hmm. And um, and it there is long if you think real long term. At some point, if the oceans continue to warm. The only species that will still survive will be jellyfish. Uh, now, I mean, that's way out in the future, but everything seems to be happening faster than we think. So it's something we might want to start cultivating a taste for roasted jellyfish. Can you eat jellyfish? Oh, yeah. yeah they, yes, you oh. can. Yeah. I don't no, think it's really as tasty as shrimp. They're, <laughs> they're salty. <laughs> <laughs> so we should probably do our next set of poll questions. <laughs> I just wanted to say that I appreciate what Soup has been trying to do, you know, to bring healthy food to the south side of Springfield. But it is the whole problem as a whole just seems so overwhelming. It does seem like there's been more of an effort in recent years to make fresh food available in place, you know, like the food bank makes an effort to get fresh food from people. Mm -hmm. And the farmer's market has started taking the food stamp cards, which they didn't do for a long time. And so mm -hmm. stuff like that makes it more possible right. for uh, people on a low income to eat fresh. It's still a challenge, but at least it's possible. Anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, let's, I'm going to launch the next set of polls here. Okay, this one says, I do most of my grocery shopping at a, choose from those options. Okay. At a large chain store. Yeah. Okay, two more. I eat at fast food restaurants. Okay. Seldom. Got one for this segment. In the summer, I buy fresh food at farmers markets. Okay. Okay. A little mix there. Often and always. That's that's good. That's good. I'm not seeing the results. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> there you are. <laughs> I'll share this with everybody now. I do have to say, uh, it, I put seldom, but part of that is because Nancy's growing vegetables in our backyard. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if, if you included that, I would have been more often. <laughs> Excellent. I took the word farmer's markets and I broadened that to farm stands, farm markets. So <laughs> I kind of cheated. <clears throat> okay, I think uh, we're ready for our last segment for this evening. Yep. Yeah. Springsteen. So our, this is our last set of questions. And just to, after looking at that to go, let's reflect on, you know, 
can't change everything all at once, but you have to look at baby steps, one thing at a time. So reflecting on what people might think is in their power to change soon and uh, what kind of support people need to make these kind of changes. I think we should um, really um, promote healthy foods as like being cool and all that because um, I think that that's important to get attention of people. You know, they, they tend to like things that are, at least the young people, do they like things that are kind of hip and all that type of thing? But uh, I think that's one way. I think as far as support, I think one thing that's important is to teach children to cook. Um, mm -hmm. I remember reading a story once where they had took a group of high school kids and gave them a cake mix out of a box. Not making a cake from scratch, using like a Duncan Hines mix. And almost none of the kids had any idea what to do, how to do that. Because they mm -hmm. didn't, couldn't relate to cup measures, teaspoon measures, and stuff like that. I mean, they'd eaten, been eating already prepared and processed foods their whole lives. And the idea to even cooking a box mix was beyond them. Um, so, and I think, I think children actually like to cook. If you do it young, um, they catch on to it and they realize this is, you know, and, you know, cook, food you cook yourself tastes a lot better, you know, and if you discover that at a young age, it can make a difference the rest of your life. I want to back you up on that, Steve, because I um, did some little garden clubs here and there in the elementary schools and, uh, and in, in the middle school. And one of the things that we do is just bring in a whole bunch of stuff from the produce aisle and just cut it up and eat it. And everybody's tasting and everybody's comment. <laughs> and I was blown out of the water, especially with elementary kids, how willing they were and curious they were that we were eating raw beets and raw turnips and I mean stuff that most of us would go nah I'm cooking that um mm -hmm. it, it, we were cutting stuff up and 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 tasting it and it was fun and we and we know that if children grow something they'll put it in their mouth mm -hmm. and the other thing is when you cook you know more about ingredients and you can relate you know like if you start talking to people about how food is produced, a lot of people think of chicken as something that comes wrapped in cellophane and cut into parts, not as a bird. And, but when you start to cook, you know, they begin to have more of a glass, well, this is a thigh. This was an actual part of an actual bird, you know, not to mention knowing what different vegetables are, and knowing what herbs and spices are. And you can kind of more readily fasten on to this whole discussion about what's in my food because you have experience with putting stuff in food. Uh, it says, what kind of support do people need? Like I'm thinking about what I personally need is I still need to know about local options. If I want to eat better, what's available locally? Like I know I can go over to Grace Lutheran, you know, I know I can be involved with McCain Acres. I know I can go to the organic I can kind of buy things at the grocery store that, that are better for me, but I think that would be something that would be helpful for people maybe to do some research and to put that out there. Like at the, you've got the uh, food stands during the summer. What if you just had a piece of paper that would have information for people about what they can mm -hmm. do to make, to get healthier food locally? You know, mm -hmm. BW Greenway, I don't know if they still do this, but they used to put out a directory every year. Okay. Of anymore, but yeah. But yeah, that's kind of what you're talking about. It's kind of what we need, isn't it? Mm -hmm. We need to have more like filming, like, like you know, like the Gangster Gardener has got his, his um, film that's out. I mean, and it reminds me of my son, Sandy, when he was little, he would eat green peppers out of the garden. And then when he got older and he started buying them, he said, what's wrong with these peppers? I said, well, there's wax on those peppers. <laughs> there's wax. So, 
Uh, but more more real life stories like that come from kids, I think is I think that's that's something that would catch my eye, you know. Yeah. Yep. There you go, Nancy. It's exactly what you're doing. <laughs> your Zoom learning <laughs> thing. <laughs> Filming people engaging in this. I think like teaching people to grow their own gardens is a good process too. Yeah. You know? And you know. Oh, you're you're muted. You're muted. From my retirement, my friend gave me some New York Botanical Garden classes. And the last one was about this woman in California who had, um, she designs edible gardens for people for their yards, <laughs> landscapes, you know, and I think, yeah, I just think there's a lot that at least homeowners can do with their property to um, eat more native things. and. But that also goes back to that very first clip about how people are so busy running from one thing to another. I think most people with children at home don't have the time to plant and tend a garden. Mm -hmm. I mean, we didn't get into gardening until our sons were pretty much grown, or at least didn't require that much care. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, you know, that's... So that, in a way, it connects to a lot of other issues about how hard people have to work just to make a livable wage. Mm -hmm. But that's probably beyond the scope of this discussion. <laughs> For sure. Well, does anyone else have any thoughts about any of this? This has been very good. I like it. If Joyce, any thoughts? We didn't hear from you. Joyce! Hi! I think this would be... You muted yourself. You're muted, Nancy. I think it'd be great to do this in the schools, you know, maybe during the day. They're not going to come in the evening, but it'd be, it's very... I, th I think this whole setup was really excellent. I think that when, <clears throat> excuse me, I think that when we have our, the Parent Woods Garden and the kids come out, they really, really enjoy it. And mm. it gives them an idea of what's, a, what's it about, what it all entails about making vegetables and growing them and harvesting them and eating them. And they, mm. they tend to love it. It's just that we can't get the, there, there we go with the parents being busy. You know, it's hard to get the parents to to bring the kids and to have a garden plot and to work it. So, yeah. but the ones with that we have done it with have enjoyed it tremendously. And mm -hmm. some of them can't wait to come back to next year, you know, wow. so yeah, they love it. I don't know if you all know, but Joyce coordinates the Perrin Woods Indian School Garden, so. If you know anybody that would like to participate in that, she's the one to get in contact with. So, well, good. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that, Joyce, because that is so true. And I think it just has to become, uh, you know, having a garden with your kid has to be as important as going to soccer practice with your kid. Right, right. Oh. Uh, for mm -hmm. our program next week on seeds, uh, Mariana Robinson, you know, she grew up on a farm and she still does all this gardening where she lives <laughs> on South Mountain. But her nephew came the day we were um, doing our interview and stuff. And so he's also on there and he also grew up on the farm and he still does this stuff. You know, he grows herbs from seeds and everything. And so I think what Joyce is saying, you know, if they learn that when they're young, Mm -hmm. They're going to do it all life, all their lives. Oh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mine definitely do. Of course, there's a big uh, nationwide surge to have plants in your house right now. I mean, it's hip right now. So, mm -hmm. mine have plants and things in our house. And 
Mallory is the only one that has um, grows food outside the house also because she's got the daughters and she's home with them and all that type of thing. But um, yeah, it's um, we just need to um, talk it up more. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, the pandemic got more people doing gardening because of course they were stuck at home. <laughs> It'll be right, interesting right. to see whether those some people, some of those people, kind of caught Definitely. the bug and will continue. Right. Had to do something. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So, well, had, we were supposed to be finishing roughly 7.30, am I correct? They're about 7.45-ish, because we, we still have just a few more poll questions for you. Oh, before, oh, we better do that then. Before we conclude. So let me just pop them up here for you. Hey, I drink blank cups of water each day. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Five to six cups of water each day was the prominent answer. Very good. Steve's demonstrating. <laughs> Uh, show off, Dusty. <laughs> okay, so this is the last poll question for the evening. Uh, Blake, do or does the food shopping in my household? Okay. You yourself. Very good, very good. Excellent. Okay, so that was that was our final poll. We thank you for participating in these polls because it's gonna give us some data that we need. Uh, and we have yeah, about maybe five minutes left. We want to uh, kind of wrap up with some final thoughts. Well, I do want to thank you, Sarah, and the library for hosting this. I think thank you very much, Big help Sarah. to have the library hosting something. It kind of gives yes. a little bit of credibility to start with, and it made it <laughs> easy for people to access the film, too, because you could go on a hoopla. So I really appreciate it. Oh, it's our pleasure. We're thrilled to uh, be a part of this and uh, future efforts in the community. That's really our, our focus now where we want to head. So we're very excited. I've got a question for folks. Like um, there are other movies that are address the food system and talk about, you know, what's going on in the food system, what's going on in our food and ways, different ways to think about it. Would uh, people, are people kind of interested in continuing to explore some of this? Thumbs up, thumbs down, neutral. Thumbs up. Thumbs up. Thumbs up. Okay. I mean, I felt like it was a fun event. You know, I think the the movie Food Inc is pretty disturbing, but mm -hmm. uh, like, <laughs> I enjoyed participating in this, and it seemed uplifting, and you know. We're trying to make a difference and do something different. So I guess in that way, it's a very positive program. And Steve and, and, um, and Sarah, good job. I mean, you had to manipulate everything and you did a great job of it. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Sherry. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Yeah, so just remember everybody next, Third Wednesday, the 24th, we're having our first Zoom into gardening class at yeah. 6.30. Is everyone signed up? I don't, you know, I've been... I'm not, but I'm coming. I guess I better sign up. <laughs> <laughs> I'll send you the link. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to see everybody. Yeah, mm -hmm. same here. Bye. 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 Thank you. Yes, thank you.